As an artist, the basis of my practice comes from dancing. Rather than it being about training, technique and athletic virtuosity, for me dancing has and always will be a social experience. I see dance less as a spectacle than a reflexive practice in which people examine themselves and their values through movement and interaction. Whether as a performer or a spectator, Performance for me takes place in an active reflective space where we witness not only our own way of being, but also that of others, to truly consider someone other than ourselves and how we coexist. Being a queer person, I'm sensitive towards positions of alterity, whereby people are neither singular nor isolated. Bodies of difference can intersect, practice mutual listening, take responsibility for themselves and one another. Almost all of my performance-based works involve direct interactions between artist and audience. My work is concerned with relational politics, examining the dynamics of intimacy and collectivity to create safe spaces that allow for care as well as risk. The work you're watching right now is called Public Actions. It is a social choreographic project that highlights the situations where bodies and objects, artists and the public, negotiate the social codes behind our collective actions. Myself and a group of performers instigate a series of ruptures that terraform the theatre and instigate a mass displacement and relocation of the audience watching from the seating bank. Here, we enact a slow moving disaster an avalanche of our bodies and chairs where we must enter into a collaborative relationship with the audience for their safety and ours. Creating work like this, I have to deeply consider and encounter consent and how it is sought and given both verbally and non-verbally and how to unpack the dynamics of the multiple relationships and roles in the situation of a performance. Throughout my work, I've approached and explored this in several ways. A video call between me and individual audience participants, both of us in pandemic lockdowns and confined to our homes. Without using language and through the anonymity of not revealing our faces, inviting a stranger into an intimate exchange between our bodies and our private spaces an anonymous gathering in the performance space where the entire audience are invited to wear full body shrouds and take part in a workshop or cult-like series of pseudo-spiritual events that point to the power of belief and what it can influence people to do. An interactive performance working with rope, knots and the practice of bondage to unpick the boundaries of desire, consent and communion between artist and audience, weaving together an interactive experience of collectivity, desire and responsibility. The work with rope has continued in several directions, working with it as a material to practice consent through negotiating the act of tying and being tied, tying a person, an object, a cultural symbol, a moment in time, even a plant. A work where plants and humans come together as collaborators, mediators and audience. Starting from the belief that plants know. Listening to, breathing with, 
arriving at moments when the in-between reveals itself. We catch a glimpse of a world where the human is not at the center, but coexists with the other. So where does all this come from? Perhaps I should give some context. My name is Luke George. I currently use he, him pronouns. I am of Arabic, Celtic and Anglo descent. I've been residing on the lands of the Kulin Nation here in Nam, also known as Melbourne, for 25 years. I grew up on Palawa lands in Lachuida, also known as Tasmania or Tassie in the 80s and 90s. A time when Tassie was a hotbed of homophobia, when consensual sex between two adult men was still illegal. Growing up in regional Tassie, it simply wasn't safe to come out about your sexuality in any way. The only way I could safely explore my desires and need for physical intimacy was through secretly seeking sex with men in parks at night time, in the centuries old tradition of cruising. It was in cruising space that I fumbled my way, quite literally, through learning about consent. Hmm, how does that work? I experience cruising as a choreography. Bodies moving through and navigating space, desire and interaction in an active observation of each other. Reading and interpreting body language and physical cues, along with the performance of gestures that signal interest and intent, seeking and giving consent. What are the movements of this choreography and how might they be interpreted? Arriving at the cruising spot, or beat as they're called in Australia, timing is important. Some beats are more active at night, some during the day, some both. For my safety and the safety of my fellow cruisers, maintaining some discretion so as not to signal to the whole neighborhood, I'm here to hook up. Lingering, arriving, and situating myself in the cruising space, displaying to other cruisers that I'm there for the same reason they are, but also being subtle in case there are non-cruisers present. I scope it out, walk around for a bit, get familiar with the space, check out who's cruising, and if it's a new spot, clock the exits. I see someone I'm interested in, or they're interested in me. Eye contact, is everything. A glance, a second one, a look back, a locked gaze. So much is potentially communicated through the eyes. Likewise, if they look away or don't meet my gaze, that's a pretty sure sign of either being nervous or anxious or just not interested in engaging with me. Generally speaking, things that are attracted to each other move towards each other. Things that aren't, move away. Touch. Perhaps I'll casually touch myself, first as a signal of interest. Then, slowly and with clear warning, attempt touching them or inviting to be touched by them through a gesture like an open palm or a small indication of my fingers, a slight tilt of my head. At first, the touch may be polite to an arm or back, leading to a more direct and intimate touch. Taking the temperature of the situation, a combination of any of these gestures between me and them back and forth to measure the response, gauging mutual interest and consent. Queerness teaches me there's no singular or binary way to be a body and therefore we can't hold on to fixed assumptions about how a body ought to be. Every person is different in how they experience and embody pleasure. Some people's signs may be not initially readable. Therefore I need to find a way to tune into the person or the people involved, inviting them to show me what they want and what feels good, and likewise for me to show them what I'm interested in and what feels good for me. It's a dance. Sometimes we have to step on each other's toes a few times before we find our rhythm and physical communication and connection. For me, 
It's all about tone. Tone in a person's breath, in their skin and muscles, in their face and eyes, how they respond to my touch and want to touch me back. I rely on these key signals as cues and clues to gauge how comfortable and interested they are. Relaxed, responsive, engaged, excited, interactive, eye contact versus tense, flinching, frozen, unresponsive, retracting, pulling away. Do they feel uncomfortable? Picking up on subtle social and bodily cues isn't always possible in the cruising space you're in or available to every individual. Also, if someone is a bit drunk or high or navigating internalized homophobia, stigma, shame, well, there's potentially a lot going on. It's a dynamic interaction. In rope and rigging terms, a dynamic load refers to a load that moves, changing magnitude or direction over time. My practice of working with rope and bondage quickly grew and enhanced from solely being an art practice to a much deeper engagement in my personal life and my other work as a sex worker, a professional dom, and a kink educator and performer. I'm completely fascinated with rope and how it's a strong yet highly malleable and sensitive material and can act like a conductor of energy and information between bodies when used in bondage. Tension, vibration, friction, weaving, wrapping, binding, entanglement, release. I've found that diving into kink, rope bondage and BDSM play has provided a heightened focus on how I am aware of and practice consent in my encounters and relationships. There can be many preconceptions that kink and bondage is about violence and an abuse of power. In my experience, this couldn't be further from the truth. The foundations I've learnt to be the pillars of any healthy BDSM relationship or interaction are communication, consent, care, and trust, which happens at all stages of the encounter. Before play, well before the actual session, to establish interests, desires, boundaries, and safety protocols. Sometimes this communication can take place over days, weeks, even years before the parties are ready to play. And then again, before the actual play session begins, affirmative consent, confirming the scene, type of play, mode of communication, roles, titles, safe words, boundaries. During play, regular communication and check-ins, often using language designated to the roles being embodied, or any agreed system of communication around degrees of intensity of action, sensation, and psychological scenario. Aftercare, directly after the play, dedicated time given to come down from the experience and allow for any emotions to be felt, seen, communicated and heard, followed up by check-ins in the days afterwards. Kink and bondage can have a lasting and sometimes delayed effect on the body and emotions, uncovering things that we didn't know we were tapping into. Also for me and them to talk through the scene, when the play reached and peaked over the edges, to further define what those edges are and how to better refine and approach the play next time. More of this, less of that. I could go further. That took me out of the experience. I need to know you're enjoying yourself. And so on. If all this sounds a bit clinical, believe me, kinksters are very creative and expressive and always finding surprising and playful ways to communicate their pleasure and needs to each other. There's nothing like a, yes, please, daddy, punish this filthy pig to signify affirmative consent. I see kink dynamics as a shared responsibility. It's not only up to the dominant, but all parties to practice consent with each other. Several times a submissive has aggressively pushed for a level of play that was beyond my boundaries as the dominant and vice versa. It's about 
building trust with each other, to communicate our needs and desires for what's considered non-normative intimacy and sex without fear of judgment, shame and rejection. For me, all of these things intersect and overlap the art, choreography, performing, dancing, cruising, kink, sex work and pro-dom work. They inform each other and teach me about consent. This is actually one of the first times that I've spoken publicly about these intersections out of respect and discretion for the people who need these spaces to explore intimacies. I want to honour that space and maintain their safety and I ask that anyone watching this presentation today does too. Thank you for listening.